So the question everyone tends to ask when we start talking about bone health is what is osteoporosis? Well, it comes down to your bones. Now, if you think about the average bone in your body, I guess the analogy I make for those is like a crunchy bar. On the outside, you've got the, the hard chocolate, and on the middle, you've got this lattice work of the other stuff in the middle. Our bones are much like that. Now, what happens with our bones is that we replace our, our skeleton every 10 years. Our entire skeleton gets replaced by adding and removing uh, bone tissue. Osteoblasts, they're called, when they become bone cells. And what we do is when we need calcium and we don't, haven't got enough in our bloodstream, we start drawing it out of our bones, out of that lattice work. Now the calcium that we need helps create energy, helps with our digestion, helps with a whole lot of things, our immune system. So we use it for a lot of our, our various functions within our body. If you don't have enough in your bloodstream and you keep drawing that calcium out of the bone, what happens is you create a crunchy with nothing much in the middle. So you've got the hard bone on the outside, and of course, snap, it's easy to break. And that's what osteoporosis basically is. Now, it doesn't happen overnight. It does take time. There are critical times, like we said earlier, when it comes to menopause, or when men get a little bit older, perhaps. But it's, it's also about a few other things, which we'll touch on now. So what are the factors that affect your risk of getting osteoporosis? Well, look, there's the obvious thing of age. The older we get, the higher our risks get because of the changes in our hormone. Gender plays a big role. Now, obviously, this is one of the times, like most of the times, where it's much better to be a man than a woman. Because as a woman, yes, your risks are one in two that you might get uh, osteoporosis or bone density issues compared to one in three in men. Genetics, if you know your mum, your siblings, your grandmother, whoever it might be, or grandfather have got a problem with osteoporosis, you need to keep an eye on it because it's one of the major risk factors, like anything to do with our makeup when it comes to genetics. What we eat's a major thing. You know, we don't eat real food that much these days. And, and as many people say, oh, yes, I do, but basically they're lying because how many people are getting in five serves of veggies and two serves of fruit a day? I don't know about you, but I didn't get in the last few days, although a few people over here put their hand up, so they're obviously doing quite well. Physical activity, we know the more weight-bearing activity you do, within reason, the stronger and thicker your bones become. The thicker your tendons become, they're attached to the bone, and that creates a reaction which makes your bones stronger and, and more structured. If you've got a history of uh, issues with your menstrual cycle, so an ab abnormal history of, of a menstrual cycle is a risk, or if you bleed intermittently for no reason, well then that's a major issue as well. Also, one I didn't realise up until a few years ago was that if you have... Um, menopause that comes early, so particularly before the age of 45, that's a massive issue, and you really need to keep an eye on it from there. We know that uh, things, people with uh, eating disorders, because of what they eat and what they do to their stomach and their ability to absorb some of the key nutrients that protect our bones is compromised, that's a major risk factor. And the other one is about men, a low testosterone level. Now we know estrogen helps protect our bones, but men, in a funny sort of way, sort of use each, the testosterone becomes a derivative of estrogen, which helps protect us. So if you've got a low testosterone level, it's going to create a factor when it comes to bone health for men. These five steps to better bone health. Now, of course, the first step, and it, it's what we always talk about in the media, is getting the recommended amounts of vitamin D and calcium into your diet. Now, one thing I will say, and this is one of the problems I see with a lot of the media these days, is... Calcium, calcium, calcium. You've got to get all this calcium in. We know you need about 1,200 milligrams of calcium a day in your diet. Postmenopause, it's up to about 1,500 milligrams. And that's fine. But unless you've got vitamin D going into your system the right way, you literally can't turn calcium into a thing called calcitriol, which then becomes a thing that gets stored into your body as the calcium that we need. So, you do need your calcium. Where do you get it from? We know where you get calcium from. You get it from green leafy vegetables. You get it from some of our dairy products. What I will say though is that really you don't have too much of that in your diet. Ideally it's the veggies and the fruits that you might get that from, particularly those green leafy veggies. Our vitamin D, well where do we get vitamin D from? Well we get it obviously the main thing that everyone talks about is getting out in the sun. Now of course we have to be careful with, with our, the cancers of the skin and whatever else, but it, 
and you need to be smart about when you get that in. We sort of talk about 15 to 20 minutes a day, but if it's 45 degrees C in the middle of the day, you don't wander out there with your half exposed because you're going to get burnt. You go out the times of the day where the UV isn't too high, which is, you know, before 11 or maybe after 3, if you're not into that. And if you do go out in those other times, well, then you obviously cover up some more, but you need to get outside. Now, for, for most of us who work in office buildings and whatever else, it's easy. Get out at morning tea or afternoon tea, lunchtime do a blocky. Because by the time you've got a bit of exercise in as well, and you've got a bit of sun on you, you've done what you've needed. But you need to get that vitamin D in. So it's a really simple thing. Eat real food. That is food that grew out of the ground or walked across the ground. That's going to be in its natural form, and that's going to be usable together with the vitamin D. My second step to better bone health is about exercise. Now, we've talked about food, now let's talk about movement. When you think about it, our food's been compromised, particularly over the last 30 years, and we don't move half as much as we used to. Simple weight-bearing exercise, and look, the recommendations are, you know, maybe two to two and a half hours of weight-bearing exercise a week. That doesn't mean out running and out jumping, it just means walking will be ideal, and while you're out there, you're getting the sun as well, so it's perfect. But if you can't do that, some exercise that's going to put your tissues under load. So it doesn't just mean walking or weight bearing. It might be doing a few weights at home. You don't have to go to the gym, although obviously that's a good option. But, you know, lifting a bit of resistance, a few push-ups, some, some stuff where you're using your body weight will actually thicken up the tendons, and that actually creates more load in the bone, which makes the bone sort of develop a thicker, stronger bone density. So just exercise. It's just a simple thing to do. The third step in getting better bone health is a no-brainer. It's about smoking and about alcohol. Don't smoke. I mean, the, the research around smoking and, and bone density is absolutely irrefutable. Not to mention that it gives you cancer and gives you heart disease and it kills you and all that sort of stuff. Just don't smoke. Now, alcohol is an interesting one. We're not quite sure how it works, but we do know is that the higher the alcohol intake, the more likely you are to get a bone density issue. So we need to make sure that we stay within the recommended levels of alcohol per week. Now we're talking, you know, the basic recommendations these days are sort of one to two standard drinks a day, five days a week with two alcohol-free days together. But there's still a little bit of evidence to say any more than one or two every two or three days is a bit risky. So I'd prefer people to go on that side rather than the other way. But, you know, that you just got to realise that if you smoke and drink together, you're putting your bones and your health at massive risk. My fourth point about how to keep your bones healthy is a really simple one. It's something we should do anyway, is to get to know your healthcare provider and get to them on a relatively regular basis. We know that, you know, once you get past 40 and there's a family history or some history about ill health in various areas, that's the point where you start seeing your doctor on a very regular basis, probably every year. Other than that, it's probably every two years until you get to 50, at which point then, you know, man, woman or child, well, man or woman at 50, um, you've got to go to your doctor every year because they can do some really simple tests that can check what's going on with your bloodstream, but also they can do things like bone densiometry, which tells us how thick your bones are or how brittle they're becoming over time. So, you know, get a healthcare provider and stick with them and make sure they know about your health and your risks and your family's risks. Fifth point about keeping your bones healthy is really a wrap up of all of them. If you think about the human body and the way the human body works, it's starting to fall apart probably since the 70s is that bone density has become a massive problem, together with heart disease and diabetes and all those sort of things. And it's, it, there's no mistake that when we look at all the things that cause these issues, it's about the modern lifestyle. Now, we're not going to be able to change our lifestyles to a certain degree, but the requirement to move a bit, eat well, make sure we control stress, we drink plenty of water, uh, and just look after ourselves generally means that we're going to avoid most of the issues that we know kill us, or ruin our quality of life over time. So point five is, have a look at the areas where you might be compromising the way we're designed to work, and you don't have to make them perfect, but just improve them slightly. So if you're only getting one service of vegetable or fruit a day, make it two or three. If you're not moving any more than 
10 minutes a day, make it 15 because you know, we know that a 5% improvement in most areas have quite a profound improvement on our health. Quick point before we finish today, one of the things that drive the promotion of health these days, particularly things like you know, Bone Health Week or Bone Health Month around the world, it was actually originally generated and continues to be generated by the dairy industry. They're the ones that came up with the idea, which is a fantastic idea. But it's led to the misconception that the only place you're going to get calcium is from milk or dairy products. And yes, they do have them, but they're only a secondary source of calcium. Our primary source needs to come from those green leafy vegetables those, and, and, and things like that. So please make sure you make that your priority.